We live. We made it. We made it. <laughs> Hopefully, folks are still sticking around because we're a little bit late due to technical difficulties. We especially like it when the software we've been using for well over a year decides to change things and we don't. Wait. Oh, wait. Where are you? There you are. Oh my gosh. I'm just walk talking about myself. Okay. There's Susan. All right. That's much better. Um, I wasn't even looking at the screen cause I was trying to pull the links and stuff. So anyway, I was just saying that we love it when the software we, we've been using for wow. well over a year, I think maybe even two years just changes things. And, uh, you don't know about it until you go to do the exact same thing you've been doing for months on end and it doesn't work. Wow. So anyway, sorry for being a little bit later than usual, but we do have some folks tuning in. So welcome everybody. We're going to get started and talk about um, helping your business stay healthy and thrive in today's world. So hopefully that's a topic of interest. We'd love to have any of your questions as we talk about this topic today. And if you are tuning in, feel free to share this with other people who might find it interesting. And you can also let us know you are able to see us and hear us by leaving a comment in the comments area. So Debbie actually said hello. So that's awesome. So we at least know that that we can be seen and heard, which is good considering the problems logging. <laughs> considering in. how the the session started, we've made great strides already. Uh exactly. Well we'll go ahead and kick it off since we did get started a little bit later than usual. So I will just say that I'm Robin Bennett. I'm one of the co-founders of the Dog Gurus and joined by Susan Briggs, the other co-founder. And the Dog Gurus helps pet care businesses launch, grow, and profit. Profit being the key thing we're going to talk about today. We also help with staff training. So a lot of uh, resources to help you train your staff when you get them on and want to hopefully keep them, which I know is a struggle today. So we do. Debbie joined us. Diane joined us. Sabine joined us. And Corey joined us. So awesome. welcome all of you guys. So I guess I'll just throw it over to you, Susan, to talk about. We were wanted. We wanted to talk today about a lot of the challenges we're hearing in the industry, and really this is not just in the pet industry overall, are how to stay not so much busy because busyness right now is not the problem. It's actually finding enough staff and covering costs and making sure that your business can still thrive despite the financial landscape right now. So where do you want to start on this topic, Susan? Because we could go a million directions. I know we could. I think I want to start with saying that I know things are busy and there's a lot going on, but you really need to stay dedicated and um, work looking at your numbers, either your financial statements, your KPI dashboard. Don't let the busyness take you away from your numbers because right now with inflation and costs going up and payroll costs going up, I, I think um, there's a real risk of seeing your own profits decrease. And for a lot of you business owners, that means your pay is going to go down. And so make sure that you're doing that monthly review of your financials, but also having um, good KPI set up that you're tracking and monitoring and don't let the busyness and the volume take you away from staying focused on the numbers. Yeah, and I guess just to put some perspective on that, I was just talking to one of our um, members like a week and a half ago about it. She had raised her prices already, so she was really excited about that, but she started wondering if maybe she didn't raise her prices enough. Yeah. And so I gave her the analogy that typically what Susan and I see is people at the end of the year, they go through this um, cost of living adjustment. They try to raise their prices a little bit at the end of the year. A lot of times that happens right after the holidays. They'll just raise the prices a little bit going into the new year. And, and sometimes people do end of year bonuses and they look at their staffing and decide if they want to give raises and that kind of thing. So we typically tell people, if you're going to be looking at raising your rates, then 10% is a goal that people often ask us, if, is that good? Should I raise them all 10%? And 10%, we would tell you 10% increase in your overall budget. It doesn't necessarily have to mean every single uh, activity is raised 10%. It might be that you're going to raise something 15% and something else 5% or 2% or whatever. But your overall budget increases 10%. We would say that's a decent goal or has been in the past, a decent goal to maintain your business 
kind of a, on a status quo. Right. If you're tr actually trying to generate a better profit and grow your business, which is what we're all about, growing your business, then we don't think, we never thought 10% was enough. 10, you probably need to be looking at like a 20% budget increase. However, that's even not good now because now if you, what, and this is what I told my, the, prof, the person I was talking to, if you raise your, your budget 10%, by the end of the year, we're probably going to see a higher rate than that in just inflation, which means you're going to actually lose money based on what you were doing last year versus this year. So your budget really needs to be understood by you well enough to really see what are those numbers you need to look at because you're not just trying to stay ahead of inflation obviously that's important but you also want to stay ahead, enough ahead of inflation that you're still making money otherwise like susan said the first thing that's going to go away is going to end up being your check your paycheck if you're the business owner most business owners we know will not cut their staff pay before they cut they, they will pay their staff and pay their staff and pay their staff and they will end up not taking up um, not taking home a big paycheck or a paycheck at all. And that's obviously not long-term health for both your physical health as well as your business health. That's not going to work. Yeah. So I would definitely be monitoring your profit dollars as well as percentage of your revenue. And then I would stay focused on how can I increase my revenue with um, services or items that don't take a lot of payroll costs. Um, so I know we've talked about memberships a lot. I think packages can also be good even or even just like treats and extra goodies like that that are easy add-ons. And I know, Robin, you like to talk about, you know, upselling and getting that revenue per pet up. That would be another KPI I'd be watching a lot right now um, is your revenue per pet and thinking about how can I increase that without it necessarily being, you know, staff generated stuff unless you do have capacity. Yeah, and I think that's the biggest thing is we all know that we, what we've seen really in the past two years with COVID is a significant increase in trying to find the right staff and keep them, which has for a lot of people meant they're increasing their wages, which I think is probably a good thing in today's uh, climate. I think you are going to, I think gone are the days, and we mentioned this a few weeks ago on another Facebook Live, gone are the days where you can just pay minimum wage. You are not going to get many people even wanting in at that level and let alone staying at that level. So you're going to have to pay your staff more. So now how are you going to pay your staff more? And also, you know, make sure that your budget is allowing you to pay yourself more as well. So doing those KPIs where you're looking at your profit percentage, which is what Susan just talked about. And then also you're looking at what is your revenue per pet and I would break that out by service as well. And then the goal is how can you how can you increase that revenue per pet without also increasing the staffing? And that is the key. So we don't we aren't just saying add on a ton more services that are going to require more staff. You want to look at what can you do to upsell things. What can you do to even if you just look at it and say I'm going to do you know once or twice a month I'm going to do a special event or a special activity or a special add on. And just go with a goal of trying to get 20% of your clients to that month to buy into that add-on. Do the math. If you could even get, you know, 20% of your clients to pay 5 to $10 more every month, that will start to add up. And if in, a, in some kind of upsell or add-on that isn't requiring you to hire another staff member, that's the goal. Memberships are huge, huge, huge. Uh, if you have not started a membership program at your facility, that is one of the first things that we would tell you to do. And actually, there's a, the other first thing, which I'll let you talk about in a second, Susan, is going to be reduce your discounts. But yeah. memberships are huge right now. And we do have, we just recently did a whole entire Facebook Live on membership, adding a membership program. You can find that on our YouTube channel. So definitely check that out. But memberships, thinking like a gym membership, memberships are a great way to get people to pay for access to your services, especially for those of you, and I know there's a lot of you, who are either very limited, you have a wait list, or you just can't take any more capacity because you're full. 
that's the best time to start a membership program, but you can really start at any time. Even if you're just starting out brand new, I would start with a membership. So memberships allow you to take additional revenue, but then the person who's buying that membership still has to pay for the services that they want from your business. So um, it's a great way to generate additional revenue. Um, so I said that would be one of the first things, but actually probably the very first thing, if you haven't done it already, we would tell you to do right now is look at your discounts. Yeah. Um, so I'll let you talk about that a little bit, Susan. Yeah, um, multi-pet discounts um, shouldn't be more than, you know, 10 or 15% off for that if you even have those. Um, and if you're offering packages to where people are buying packages, make sure packages have an expiration date. But I wouldn't do a package plus a multi-pet discount because then you've got double discounts going. So people with multiple pets can buy a package. So like at my daycare, um, they offered a 30-visit package, which was the cheapest rate I could get, which is what I did. And I have two dogs. And so they share the package. So I wouldn't be layering discounts, which we find a lot of people do, even if you provide some of the community discounts for, you know, fire, police, um, seniors, military, all those are great, but don't layer them on top of everything else. And so your total discounts should be right around 10% on average. Um, and so, yeah, that's a way if you've got discounts that are more than that, or you're double letting people double dip, that's one of the first things that you could make a change to and see more revenue. And we talk, a lot of times people just, they don't really think about why they're giving the discount. So try to figure out why you do want to do the discount and do it in a way that helps the business, not just necessarily the pet parent. We are really, really good as an industry at just saying, well, you know, we should just help them because they've got three dogs. So we just want to give them a discount. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> Uh, it was their choice to get three dogs. So you don't necessarily have to take the hit. And when you're giving discounts, we have in our head, I feel like um, 10 and 15% is a good discount, quote unquote, good discount. So I think in our minds, we tend to just say, we're just going to do 10%. Well, 10% might end up being $5, but you could actually just do 50 cents or a dollar. And people are still would be happy with that discount. I mean, it's the fact that they're, getting a discount that most people like, not necessarily the amount of that discount. So instead of doing a flat 10% as a discount for something, you might just look at saying, well, let's only do 8%, but that ends up being, you know, $1.50 instead of $3 or whatever it is. So look at, look at that. And then I put in the notes, if you aren't doing this, I would start doing this. And that is track the amount of money that you're losing because you have given a discount. And I will tell you, I, I think there have been very few people that started tracking it that then didn't say, I'm getting rid of discounts right. or I'm at least dropping them a little bit. Because when you start tracking it, it is in the thousands. Like oh, yes. I'm talking like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year. When you start paying attention to all those people that buy that 10 day pass and they save a little bit of money, how many times has that happened throughout the year and track how many of those there are? and do the math. What would you have made if you just didn't offer that discount? Or even if you cut the discount by a third or a half, Right. because if you're talking 50, $60,000 a year, that's money that's just without you doing anything different, no additional payroll, no additional services, no additional anything, you could make a, a whole significant amount of money that stays right in your business or goes right into your pocket or if you have to do renovations or whatever, it can go wherever you want it. But the bottom line is it amounts to a lot. And, and when you don't see it in, in the number, you don't actually see the number because you're not tracking it. You don't realize it. I'm telling you, once you track, this is why we're so good, big on tracking numbers. Once you start tracking the numbers, you're going to be shocked at how high it is. And that will end up giving you the motivation to make some changes in that area. So it's a huge thing. Um, so De Dennis said, what would you say is an appropriate retention rate for memberships? Mm -hmm. Gyms can lose up to 50% of their members. Is that appropriate in our field, higher or lower? That's a I great think our retention should be higher. I would shoot for 80 to 90%. Yeah. And that's, that's mm -hmm. typically, that's a really good question, Dennis. The, um, we typically do see those memberships higher and it does depend on how you run your, well, I don't, I don't think the retention will depend. I think you'll have a high re higher retention regardless. But we have seen people who do monthly memberships. We've seen people who do quarterly memberships. 
And then we've seen people who do annual memberships. So that's going to, that's going to dictate a little bit of your cash flow and when you're seeing that money come in and that kind of thing. Um, and the predictability of it as well. Monthly, if you have a monthly membership, it becomes much more predictable in terms of monthly revenue because we would say set it up as an automatic payment. So, um, and retention that's even there, retention should be relatively high though. Mm -hmm. So that is really- yeah, It's funny how people will spend on their dogs more than they'll spend on themselves to get healthy, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know I do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So that's why our memberships work so well in our industry. You know, the other thing that I think I would be looking at right now, Robin, that we don't always talk about is um, looking at occupancy by service because occupancy, so like what is your capacity either for lodging, daycare, training classes, privates, you know, your baths, grooms, nail trims, that kind of stuff. What's your capacity to do in a day? with your time slots and your number of staff and what are you running? What percentage of that are you filling? Because all of those spots, if you don't fill them, it's just like um, seats on an airplane or a hotel room that's not occupied. It's missed revenue opportunity. So focusing on how can I get closer to 80, 90% occupancy on some of these services, that's where you can focus on those add-ons you were talking about. If you've got the capacity and the staff there anyway, you know, remind people, set up monthly recurring nail trims. We know every pet should have a nail trim every month. Some pets should have a bath every month. And, you know, focus on getting some of that um, recurring services in that will increase that revenue per pet as well. But I think we've kind of moved away from looking at occupancy in our industry, which is um, an issue. We shouldn't do that. Yeah. And everybody knows, I mean, every, I think most people get into this industry and they just sort of assume like Christmas is going to be awesome. And Thanksgiving is going to be awesome. Summer is pretty good, but then, and spring break pretty good. But then the rest of the year, they're like, man, we're going to have really low occupancy then. So rather than just accepting that as fact, obviously you're probably not going to add, and we would not recommend adding a ton of additional things over the peak seasons because your staff is already so busy just managing and maintaining and offering great quality care to the larger numbers of pets that you're seeing. But when you, if you know the January is super slow or right after spring break, it's going to be really slow, then start building in those plan them out now, plan out activities now that you can say, hey, well, as soon as spring break's over, we'll take a week to regroup and kind of catch our breath. And then we're going to offer this thing to help fill some of those occupancy um, deficiencies that you're going to see because you're going to go from, you know, 100% occupancy down to like 30 or 40 in certain areas. And you can do things like if you have a whole bunch of lodging enclosures that are empty, you can do an add-on where you're doing a puzzle toy and you yeah. put dogs in those lodging enclosures with a puzzle toy to play with. And you can generate a little bit of revenue that way. And it doesn't, that again, doesn't take a ton of time. It doesn't take a ton of, um, drawing your staff away, you could do it during nap time, whatever, like just figure out ways that you can increase the occupancy in some of those areas. It's also a good thing to look at if you routinely have super low occupancy in some of the areas of, of your services, that might also be a time to look at, should you keep doing that service? Because we have seen during COVID, we don't necessarily say just keep adding and adding and adding and adding. Like sometimes if you have most, most of the businesses we work have three core services. And once you start getting four and five and six, that's awesome. Cause I think one-stop shopping is great, but make sure that if you have six, seven, eight services, if you've got a whole bunch of services, are they all worthwhile? If one of them is a lot of work, but it's not bringing in a lot of revenue, it may be time to just kick that to the curb and fill it with something else. Yeah. So really understanding where your money is coming from. And that's why we're big advocates of breaking down your revenue and your costs by service so that you can make sure every service is profitable. That would be number one. If you have services that aren't even profitable, then those should go away. There's no reason that one of your services should be losing money unless it's generating revenue to build another service and then it's a loss leader. But if it's just a service you're offering, but it's not generating revenue, kick it out. So I would look at that as well. I would look at that as well. Um, the last thing I was going to talk about before, uh, 
making sure your business can survive these times that we're in right now. This is a really good time. And I don't, I, because Susan, you and I are both kind of productivity geeks. Mm. So <laughs> Susan and I's like entire goal in life is to get more free time. Like, like, like seriously, we talk about at the beginning of the year, when we're doing our goals, we talk about the goal of how much free time are we going to have? Like how much time is Susan going to be able to spend at the beach? How much time am I going to be spending in the RV? Like these are literally on our business goal stuff. Like not just all this work we have to do. Obviously those are goals, but I remember, I remember a couple of years ago, Susan was, Susan was like, what, what was that? Oh, Susan was like, I want to take off a hundred days a year this year, a hundred days this year. And uh, I was like a hundred days days is ridiculous. How are you going to have a hundred days? I remember thinking that. And she goes, no, I'm counting weekends. And I'm like, well, if you're counting weekends, that's barely even that you're taking the weekends off. And she goes, I know that's where I'm starting. <laughs> yeah, that's, And that's where I know a lot of these people need to start as well. Yeah. So when she told me that I was like a hundred days a year, that seems excessive, <laughs> but, and obviously like we're partners. So I'm like, she can't take a hundred days off. Cause I'm going to have to work all those days. And then I realized she's really just talking about, she's trying to get the weekends off, which is what I wanted as well. But you need to have that conversation with yourself to say, literally how, if you're working seven days a week, that is not sustainable. It might, you might be able to do it. It's not sustainable for your health or for your business health. And we say all the time, the folks that tune into us, the folks that um, are really doing education for their team and for themselves, you guys are the ones we want to see in business forever. Cause you guys are the ones that are really providing quality care for these pets. And we don't want to see you burn out, but that means that along with whatever other goals you're planning, you should have a goal of what your vacations are going to look like. One of the first things that Susan and I put on our calendars every year is what we want to try to do for vacations. But now we've, we've like, um, we've like jumped significantly from the, you know, a hundred days off a year. So now it's really, we're trying to disconnect from our internet for once a week, every month. And we're going to try to build up to where we both can take a week off every month, not just weekends. So that, and those things take time, but in order to get there, you also have to build significant streamline into your operations and you have to start documenting and creating processes for everything you do. So that's really where I would start looking to so help. Robin, you I've taken 39 days so far this year. <laughs> See, that's not even that great. <laughs> and that counts the weekend. So, but yeah, yeah, no, it's better than, than before, but you do have to be intentional about it and you do have to get your systems in place, as you said, so that the people, the business can operate without you, which is, I think, why a lot of us, we got into business to serve. We love the pets. We want to do that. But I think we also wanted that freedom that comes with being your own boss and, I think for so many people that freedom's been lost. And I know the last couple of years have been hard, but we're kind of into the new normal. And so you've got to get back to setting what goals are going to keep you happy and keep you engaged and enjoying being in your business. And freedom may have a big part of that. It does for us. And yeah. it's great. I tell you, this year with some of the changes we've made, I'm loving the business more than I have in a long time. Yeah. And that's what we really want to see for everybody because you do, when you start not taking a paycheck, you're paying your team, but you're not taking a paycheck yourself, or your paycheck is not much higher than your highest paid team member. It should be significantly higher than your higher highest paid team member. Um, and I realize why some people do that because they don't have the revenue coming in or they don't have enough dogs or whatever. But when you keep operating that way, you will start to resent your business. And you'll start to resent your staff and you'll start to not be happy. And the, all the excitement of why you got into this business starts to get clouded. So really looking at, and this, I think this is now more important than ever, especially after two years of stress from COVID and lockdowns and masking. And I mean that everybody is going through anyway. So you really want to make sure that you're building your business in a way that it's sustainable and valuable ultimately when you do want to exit. And that means streamlining, I mean, building in operations. I would talk to your team about how to streamline operations. I'm telling you right now, if you're, if you have a ton of redundancies or you just have set up, and this is true for me. So you, I initially ran my own business by myself, right? 
so many of us do. We start by ourselves and we start hiring team members. And then as we hire those team members, we teach them how to do everything based on how we were doing it. And we think that's the best way. <laughs> that's exactly my mindset for many, many years until the team members start going, this is stupid. Like we do this in the morning and then we do it again at two. Why don't we just do it once like in the middle of the day or whatever? They have like a million, you know, they have a million of those conversations around the water cooler or in your lunchroom or whatever without you. They are talking that way all the time. If there are things that they're doing that they don't think is efficient, if you don't make it safe for them to tell you those things, all they'll do is they'll just keep doing them your way. They'll grumble about them. And ultimately you're wasting time and money. Yeah. Your staff usually is the best source for how to streamline your operations. Now that doesn't mean reducing quality care or anything like that. There are certain standards you want to have them adhere to. But beyond that, I was constantly talking to my team about like, what, how can we change things up a little bit? But then I, and then I also had to be humble enough to let them change the things that I was doing that I thought were so perfect. Yeah. So there's a little bit of that too. So there's a little bit of education for me as well, but really trying to streamline things. This is a time and day where you need to have bare minimum um, for what you're going to accept as quality care. And then all the other stuff, try to find out a way to streamline those things that where the quality of the care you're providing doesn't suffer, but you can save staff time and stay, save resources, hopefully. So that's a huge thing. Yeah, I think one area for opportunity may be looking at um, if you're, you know, doing checklists or making lists that are outside of your software, or if you've got multiple software that don't talk to each other, and so you're entering stuff multiple times, that's a great opportunity. And you may have to dig in with your software providers to learn about the features, because software can do so many things that often we just, we know what we know. And so we use that piece and we don't realize that some of the things we're not using it for, it would do for you. And it's a, that's an opportunity to find um, savings of time. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that I love when we have, sometimes we'll have group calls with our profit network members. This happens also in the Facebook groups, which I'll talk about at the end of the session, but we have a um, free Facebook group for people. And sometimes we'll, people will get on there and they'll be like, I'm really struggling to do this. And then invariably someone go, oh, you use this software? You know, you can just go to this report and it does it automatically. Yeah. And, and I've seen that, my, I've even seen that with our software. And statistically, when you buy any kind of new software, whether it's an iPhone, an iPad, a computer, whatever, any software you download or app you download, just think about this because I found this to be true. Whatever you learn, like the first three to four days, those are the things you end up using. Mm -hmm. And then you don't realize that there's a whole bunch of other stuff that you can do. And we kind of run out of time to keep researching it and we get the bare minimum that we wanted. And then we just kind of get lost after that. And this has happened with our software. We use Infusionsoft. It's called Keep Now. But there's new features always being added. And we have um, an employee who's, that's her sole job, is to manage our CRM, our customer database. And every now and then I'll be like, I wish there was a way to do this. <laughs> this happens like more than I would like to admit. I'll be like, Monique, I wish we could do this. And then Monique will like, we can. I'm like, what? Like, I have been doing something for two years manually. And then she'll be like, I wish you'd have told me you were doing that because the software totally does it. And I'm like, oh, so definitely look at that. And, and it might mean it's worth it. If you have to pay a couple hundred dollars to build some yeah. custom report that you're trying to manually do every month or every quarter or whatever, it's probably worth it. Like add up the time you're spending on some of that. So yeah, that's a huge one as well. I did put in the comments, automate as much as you can. The more you can automate things, the better your business will end up being because you'll get, it might take a little bit of time to initially set up the automation, but then after that, it frees up your time and you can spend time doing, or your staff can spend time doing other things. Um, Christina said, what's an example of a loss leader? So um, go ahead, Susan. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I can give an example and you probably can too, but when we yeah. had, um, we put in our pool and so on Thursdays, the first Thursday of every month, we did a free puppy swim. So we got no revenue, but that took staff time and um, um, supplies and stuff. So that was a lost leader. But our goal with that was to get puppies in that we could then convert to other services and long-term clients. 
Yeah, and that's I did uh, puppy classes at my facility, but I also did some at the veterinarians' offices where I pitched it to the vets to say, look, you get these puppies in and you have to give them their vaccines and check their health and do all their vitals and all that. And then, you know, the puppy owner is going to ask about like what to feed them and how to stop house. Tra- I mean, how to house train them and how to stop chewing. And I, why don't you just tell them all to come to a session and I'll teach them all of that stuff. And then you can see more puppies because you can say, you know what? Those are all great questions. We have a trainer that comes in once a month and teaches all new puppy owners, all of that stuff. And so it was a win for the vet because it freed up the veterinarian's time to actually do what veterinarians do best, which is take care of the animals. And then I didn't charge for it. I just showed up. But if you're going to do something like this, where you're going to offer a service for free, because obviously it took my time. It took my other trainers times who would sometimes fill in. It took, you know, paperwork time for me to figure out who was who and track it and put them in our system. Like there was, there was definitely cost involved, but I also tracked the people from those classes that signed up. And I knew, I knew for my, for those puppy classes, 80% of those puppies would sign up for a class. So it was a great, it was just marketing money basically. So it's a loss leader. I'm not getting anything up front, but I'm tracking it. And I know 80% of those people will sign up with a class for me. So evaluations are similar. Like you might do a free evaluation. If you know you, you are doing enough pre-screening that you know, those evaluations are turning into paying clients. It might be worthwhile. Some people just charge for their evaluation. So they don't have to worry about it. So any kind of loss leader is anything that you can do and you're giving something away for free, but you're tracking the data to show that long-term you're totally covering those costs in clients that you're gaining and you and hopefully gaining and keeping that client for several years. So that's yeah, a, little- a, lot of, a loss leader could also be, you may be charging a small amount. Like we charged a small amount for our evaluations, but it didn't cover the cost of having two people for as long as it was. But again, you wanted to then convert them to being regular customers. Um, pickup and delivery oftentimes doesn't cover costs. But again, if you're making enough with the services that you're picking up and delivering for, it might work. I mean, I would try if it's a real paying service that doesn't have a strong marketing that you at least break even versus having a loss leader. Yeah, I would agree but with that. Back to your discounts. You have to know why you're doing it. And like Robin said, track your data so that you know that your conversions pay for it in the end. So I was just trying to find this, but... I can't multitask Joyce, but Joyce had said, where is your video on memberships? I don't see it in YouTube. It should be in the, there's a playlist in the YouTube channel on additional revenue streams and it should be in there. I'm actually just trying to find it on our blog too, because usually we put it, we end up putting it on the blog as well. Oh wait, here it is. I think I might've found it. Hang on. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. Okay. So here, I'm going to put this link in the comments. So this is the blog article about the membership, but it that links to the YouTube. It, well, in the blog, if you open up the blog, the YouTube video is there. And then obviously if you click on that video, you can watch the video there on the blog or it'll take you over to YouTube as well. But you can find that there. And also in that blog, there's a little flyer that we did create on kind of the steps to creating a membership program too. Joyce said she found it. Awesome. Oh. All right, any last minute comments? Yeah, I'll say say if anybody is doing pickup and delivery with fuel costs going up as much as they are, if you don't want to like raise your rates, you could do a short term like additional fuel fee that you're just charging that helps cover your increased costs. And I bet if you look at a lot of the things that you have delivered to you, you're going to see that's already in place by other companies. So, Um, yeah, I know not not that I use Uber a lot eats a lot but (laughs) but i have noticed that uber eats is starting to do that um and i think it's just the cost of doing business so definitely look at those types of expenses if you're doing and that same thing if you're doing for those of you who are pet sitters who are driving driving is a part of your business or mobile groomer driving is a part of your business you might look at that um surcharge as a kind of temp maybe temporary maybe it becomes permanent i don't know but Either that or you just have to in flat out increase your rates because you're you're definitely at a situation where you're getting additional costs that 
weren't planned, probably weren't planned for to make, to make sure that you're increasing your pricing that you're getting your, what you're charging your clients to make sure you're covering those costs. All right. I mentioned our Facebook group, so I'm going to put a link here real quick. Um, if you're not in our Facebook group, we would love to have you there. It's a free Facebook group. It's uh, all kinds of other business owners in there, of all different types of pet care businesses. And our whole goal in there is just to have build a community, be able to ask questions, get to know each other, um, share ideas. Our only two rules for the Facebook group are you have to be nice. That's like one of our core values at the dog gurus is you have to be nice. And then we just don't want you to go in there and sell stuff. If you do either of those two things, we will kick you out and uh, you could try to come back, but we might not let you back in. <laughs> but anyway, most of the people in there are just wonderful, though. It's really good conversations and just so many different ideas. And it, it's a good place to just go and talk. And it's a safe place to share ideas or vent or whatever. So definitely join us over there. And hopefully some of you are going to go to our business breakthrough workshop, which was next week. I can't believe awesome. it's finally here. Um, two years in the planning. <laughs> we've been planning this for two years. We actually had this all planned yeah. uh, back in 2020. It's changed significantly now, but back in 2020, three weeks before the event, or maybe two weeks before the event, we had to cancel it because because yeah. of the pandemic. Um, so now we're finally getting around to getting back together live. We've re tooled the entire conference. So it's actually much more applicable, obviously, to COVID times. And our biggest focus at the conference is really going to be to help build your business, make it stronger, especially in today's with today's financial landscape and staff shortaging landscape. And we have a HR expert yeah. from outside the pet industry who's going to come in. Her entire business is all about hiring and retention and how to get people on your team to that will stay on your team. So she's doing a lot. She's doing three different sessions to, and you will walk away with a job description and plans and a strategy for your whole hiring process. So we're really excited about having Andrea there. She was actually going to be there two years ago, but we've expanded her role at the conference because staffing has become such a huge issue. So let's, so we did have a couple of people saying they would see us here. Um, Let's see, can you please put the link? The link to the membership blog is like, if you, Karen, if you look like two comments above, that link to that membership blog is in there. Christina said she'll see us there, awesome. And then Joyce said, are you gonna do a webinar on selling a pet care business? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, um, we, we can do a live on that. Yeah, we will, that's a great idea. We, we have done some webinars on, um, selling your business. A lot of what we focus on in terms of selling the business is actually on the stuff you need to do before you go to market, which is build your business so it's as valuable as possible. So we have a lot of experience in terms of understanding what your business needs to look like to make it appealing to someone who wants to buy it. For the actual, I will say, uh, logistics of going through the sale, we have several coaches on our team that have actually sold their business, including me and Susan. We both have sold businesses in the past, um, but we typically will refer people to um, National Kennel Sales or um, NVA in the past, although they have kind of taken a step back from buying pet businesses right now. Destination Pet is another one that does a lot of the logistical part of, you know, actually buying businesses or selling or uh, selling businesses. So I would look at some of those options as well, but we can definitely do a Facebook Live on some of the key things that you need to start thinking about if you do want to sell. So that's a great idea. All right. Any, uh, did I put the link to the membership page? Oh yeah, I did. Okay. So put the link to the membership page in there. We will see some of you next week. We won't have Facebook live next week because we will be physically we'll live, be live, live in Jacksonville. We, we still do have a couple of seats left. If you're interested in attending that conference, um, you can go to the doggurus.com and you'll find the link on that page. If you want to come, we would be happy to see all of you in Jacksonville. Otherwise we'll be back in a couple more weeks with more stuff. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Have a great day.